Good morning, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're really delighted to be joined by Peter Goodman, um, who is the global economics correspondent for the New York Times and the author, author of a terrific book called Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devoured the World. We're going to have a great conversation about that. Peter's an interesting background. He went to Reed College as an undergrad, University of California, Berkeley, has a master's degree, um, has, has covered the world, some far-flung locations, Alaska, Southeast Asia, Japan, China, London, New York, and a lot of other places, has worked for some terrific organizations, uh, Washington Post, Huffington Post, International Business Times, and on two separate occasions, the New York Times, including now. Uh, in addition to Davos Man, Peter wrote a book about a decade ago called Past Due, the End of Easy Money in the Renewal of the American Economy. Um, and he's just a terrific writer. As it happens, and I wish I could say I planned this, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Davos Economic Summit, which is actually happening this week. It usually happens in January in Switzerland, but because of COVID, they moved it to this week. So this uh, is a very timely discussion. So, Peter, great to see you. Thanks so much for having me, John. Well, so, Peter, tell us about uh, your, your journey to be an economics reporter. I, as I mentioned, as we started, in an earlier life, I did that. And I right. was surprised at how many of my fellow business reporters had never really expected it. We sort of fell into it through, you know, we had an interest in politics, economics, the world, but had never really charted a path towards business writing. I mean, how, what was your journey? Yeah, I, I am also an accidental business slash econ writer. Uh, you know, my journey was right out of college. I was super interested in Southeast Asia. I'd written a, a bachelor's thesis on the role of the media in the Philippine Revolution of 1986. And I had this very vague idea that I'd go off to Asia, uh, ideally somewhere where the language was not a problem for me. In the Philippines, I could work in English. I knew the cast of characters from having written this thesis. And I'd start freelancing. And that's Essentially what I did, I, I, I worked for a while in Japan for the Japan Times as a feature writer. Then I, I based myself in Manila for a couple of years, was based in Indonesia for a year or so, spent a lot of time in Cambodia and Vietnam, and quickly figured out that the life of the freelancer was not as good as the staff writer. Uh, and so I thought, well, I'm going to go back to the States and I'm going to, first of all, I had a lot to learn just in terms of the basic craft of journalism. I'd never covered a beat. I hadn't gone to J school. I, I was just winging it as a feature writer. So I got a bunch of jobs that were very useful to me. I was a cub reporter at the Sacramento Bee, the zoned community news insert covering Yolo County. Got a job up at the Anchorage Daily News. That was my first real metro uh, assignment where I, I covered uh, someone you may have heard of named Sarah Palin when she was a uh, just a local member of the Wasilla City Council. And all the while, I was trying to get to a place that could really send me to Asia as a staff correspondent. Eventually, I hired on at the, at the Washington Post, uh, was a Metro reporter for a while. And then, uh, quite frankly, in a very mercenary fashion, looked around in 1998 and said, well, what can I do that will put me in a position where I can get to Asia? I covered the dot-com bubble, which it turned out was fascinating. I moved to the business desk, learned an awful lot about technology, about balance sheets, about business in general. Uh, and eventually they said, well, how'd you like to go to Asia to be the Asian economic correspondent? And I said, how quickly can I get there? They gave me a year of language training. I was in Taiwan where my job was just to study Chinese for a year. And then they sent me to Shanghai uh, this is, uh, we're talking uh, 2001, uh, 2002 by the time I moved to Shanghai. And I was there for almost six years. And it was, you know, just a wonderful adventure. I mean, first, just being a reporter covering anything in China in those years was in incredibly uh, interesting and, and exciting. And there really was no difference between covering politics and covering economics, because it was a reform process. Uh, and everything was political, everything was economic. But that lens of uh, economics really stuck for me. I mean, you can write about anything through the economic lens. You can write about culture, you can write about food, you can write about labor, race, society. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all in there. So 20 some odd years later, I'm still at it, having you know, gone to the Times as the national economic correspondent, just in time to cover the Great Recession, uh, and I went back uh, to the Times after a few years at the Huff Post and the International Business Times as an editor uh, and became the European economic correspondent just in time for Brexit and then Donald Trump and the trade war and, and so much uh, momentous history since. 
Well, I mean, just the title of Global Economics Reporter seems pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And I and I know I saw someone refer to you as a roving economic correspondent. I mean, tell us a little bit about your beat. How do you uh, look out for stories, go after them, report them? Tell us about how it works. You know, honestly, it only makes sense in retrospect. So the job I took to go back to the Times in the middle of 2016 was more defined. It was go find economic stories uh, within Europe. And at that point, Brexit was a huge story. And the permutations of that uh, touched you know, every aspect of life across the continent. Uh, there, was a, there was a local story in terms of where my base was in London, just writing about the potential impacts on trade and, and, and economy and, the, and writing about small businesses and how they were affected by these potential uh, changes. Uh, but then you know, it became clear that London is the ideal place to cover the globe. And uh, I had interests that went beyond Europe. And my editor said, sure, you want to go to South Africa and write about uh, economic apartheid 20 years after political apartheid's gone? Let's do that. Oh, uh, somebody pitched me on an interesting story that involved migrant workers in the United Arab Emirates. So I went off and learned something about the Persian Gulf. Uh, I'd spent some time in India previously as a reporter. So they said, well, why don't you go do an economic story uh, pegged to the Indian elections in 2018. And so it went. And then, uh, of course, the, the rise of right wing populism, for lack of a better way of putting it, became a truly global story. And I pitched a series of stories looking at the economic dimension to the, uh, the, 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 this movement, this shift to the right, lots of political parties popping up from the Philippines to Brazil, uh, demonizing immigrants, uh, and the commonality there, which actually became this book that we're talking about today, was beneath this political opportunism where you have movements that mobilize to blame outsiders, usually immigrants, for problems are some very real problems that reflect this kind of systematic pillaging by the people who actually have economic power to write the tax code in their favor, to uh, do mergers that uh, produce monopoly power. So I pitched this series of stories looking at this whole broader context. That took me to the Philippines to look at the failure of land reform, which it turned out was uh, part of the explanation for how uh, Rodrigo Duterte, who's this right-wing extremist, you know, how he had taken power. I ended up spending a lot of time in Europe, uh, in Sweden, in Italy, in France, Again, looking at the economic dimension such that the, the ground was laid for some movement to come along and blame uh, usually immigrants for, for real problems. Well, I want to jump into your book in a second, but I, I want to just mention I've been reading your, your, a lot of your writing and your, your writing on, the, on the, the, the supply chain crisis has just been amazing. And oh, thank you. The, the thing that I, I think is most striking is just the way that you're able to tell a kind of a difficult, conceptually complex story by by telling stories about real human beings and i just uh, you wrote this terrific article in late march called this is what happens when globalization breaks down and you tell the story of a gentleman by the name of hagen walker a young engineer uh in um, starkville mississippi who has a small startup company that is utterly dependent upon a factory eight thousand miles away in china um and you actually tell the story of his sort of quest to bring a container from coastal China to central Mississippi. Tell us a little bit about, about how you sort of stumbled on that story and what you're trying to show with it. Well, first of all, thanks for putting the focus on that, because that uh, is a central thread of the next book, which is called How the World Ran Out of Everything. Um, essentially, you know, I'm in London uh, until last summer when I moved with my family back to New York, really just for family reasons. Uh, Everybody wanted to be closer to family. Uh, and the pandemic's happening, and I'm finishing up Davos Man, uh, and I'm uh, becoming aware of this supply chain chaos really quite accidentally. I'm, I'm doing a Brexit story, looking at the impact of new customs checks, and, and I end up just cluing into the shipping situation. Somebody mentions to me that uh, it's it now costs like 10 times as much to ship a container full of manufactured goods from Asia to the port of Rotterdam, which is Europe's largest port in the Netherlands. And it's even more in the UK because there are these customs disruptions. And it occurs to me, well, this, this sounds like more than a Brexit story. And, and I, I do some fairly elementary digging. And at this point, you know, some good publications have already noted the shipping crisis, but it was new to me and discovered 
uh, this what has become my kind of reporting obsession over the last uh, year to 18 months, which is that there's this shortage of containers in China and the global shipping industry is really interesting. Uh, some would describe it as an oligopoly. You've got these three alliances, all foreign companies, by the way, that dominate the global shipping trade. And they are now charging 10, 12, 15 times as much to move containers from the, the coastal cities that dominate manufacturing in China to the West Coast of the United States. That's the primary gateway for manufactured goods in what is still the world's largest economy. Uh, and so I do a, ser a series of stories. Uh, and then uh, a few stories in, I realized that it would be really interesting to try to trace one single container from China to a business in the US. And that actually took me several months casting about I mean, I, my inbox is filling up with pitches for various public relations companies. You know, they want me to write about the software solution to the supply chain problem or the success story or whatever. And I just keep saying, hey, what I really want is somebody who will open up their world and show me what it takes now to get a load of goods made in China and shipped to the U.S. And eventually a company called Freitos, which is like uh, sort of like Expedia and PayPal combined for container shipping. If you're looking to move something, you go on there, they give you a bunch of quotes. They said, well, how'd you like to talk to this startup in Starkville, Mississippi? And I had one conversation with this guy, Hagen Walker, who's a really interesting character. You know, he, he's, he's from rural Mississippi. He's such a tinkerer that when he was three years old, he actually pulled off the deadbolt. He learned how to use an electric, electric screwdriver. And his parents discovered this because he, he took off the deadbolt from the front door. Uh, and by the time he was in high school, he was making money, repairing people's computers. He saved up money that he put into mutual funds that then became the seed capital for this company that he launched instead of taking a job at Tesla. I mean, this, this guy went... Uh, to Mississippi State University in Starkville, which is a, a top engineering school, especially in the region, got an internship to go work at Tesla. He said, no, actually, I want to start my own company. He started this company that makes these novelty items, these little plastic cubes. You drop them in water, they light up, which was a, you know, originally he was going to sell it to bartenders and they could look down and see, oh, the light went off, they refill needed over there. Uh, and then he heard from a customer who uh, had a child who suffered from autism and she had dropped these cubes into the bathtub and bath time had been a nightmare for this family. I mean, the child was very disturbed by the sound of rushing water, the feeling of being confined. And suddenly this kid was just transfixed by this cube. So that became a whole new line that now dominates this company called Glow where they make these light up dolls. Uh, they had, a, and, and when I, dove into the story. They just signed a deal with Sesame Street. They were going to make these light up dolls themed with Elmo and a new character named Julia, who, who is autistic. And this first shipment that I followed, that was the first shipment large enough to fill up a 40 foot container. And I spent time talking to their Chinese factory. I got the backstory on how there was a material shortage. It was hard to get plastics. It was hard to get containers. And then the nightmare of moving their stuff around coastal China with ports shut down from COVID. Eventually, they get their container uh, moving all the way uh, to Long Beach, which is you know part of the Long Beach LA complex. That's the gateway for something like 40% of all imported goods uh, coming into the States. And then predictably, their ship gets stuck in this the mother of all floating traffic jams. There's like 50 plus other ships from around the world. Stuff sits there for a month. Uh, they're terrified they're going to miss Christmas. They're going to have to tell Sesame Street that their first ever shipment is delayed. And somehow through persistence and luck, they managed to find uh, a truck driver who hauls their stuff all the way from Long Beach to their warehouse in Starkville, Mississippi. And Elmo makes it to the various customers in time for Christmas. And I'm, I'm going to basically use that story to then peel back you know, pull back at different places. Like, here's why they're concerned about trucking. Here's why they can't put this stuff on the rail. Uh, here's the nature of uh, the the shipping industry, as we've already discussed, uh, as a way, as, as the sort of organizing thread that will help take us through all parts of the supply chain.
Well, and then you, we'll get your book in just one second, but you also had this another terrific story on how America farmers got cut out of the supply chain. And you're talking about, you, you profiled a gentleman, Scott Fippen, who has this almond ranch or orchard in, in Central Valley of California. And he's, he has 30 million pounds of almonds that he's trying to send to, uh, to Asia, the Middle East and Europe. They're just sitting there. And, and these ships that usually come in from LA, that come in fr from China to LA and Long Beach, uh, typically offload, and then some of them at least come up to Oakland to pick up, pick up some of these farm pro products, and then head off across the Pacific. And they're so busy, they just are hustling back to China rather than coming right. up north a little bit. Tell us just briefly about that story. Yeah, that's a crazy story. Uh, so I was looking for examples of companies that are affected by the shipping crisis, and the shipping crisis. Has, has many dimensions to it. I mean, there are these floating traffic jams. There's a shortage of containers. There aren't enough people working in warehouses or truck drivers to haul stuff to warehouses. So at every step of the supply chain, there are these various backups. And one day I got a call. I was actually in LA doing some reporting. Uh, and I got a call from uh, somebody connected to the Almond Alliance, you know, an, an entity I'd never even heard about. And she said, yeah, look, here's the deal. So we usually, as you described it, uh, will catch what's known as the backhaul, uh, where like the, you know, companies like Amazon, Walmart, Target, and other importers are bringing in huge volumes of stuff, mostly from China, but from Vietnam, from other parts of the globe, uh, from factory uh, towns, basically, to these giant ports like LA and Long Beach. And then they unload the containers. So, you know, off come our running shoes and electronics and Peloton bikes or whatever stuff we're bringing in from Asia. And then they take these containers and they will send some of them by truck, some by rail, some by ship up to other places they're needed. They'll send some by rail into the middle of the country to go pick up grains. They will send some up to the port of Oakland, which is the primary export gateway for agricultural commodities uh, like almonds. Only now... They can make so much money sending more manufactured goods from China back to the United States that the time it takes them to send the container up to Oakland, forget about it. They just they're taking the empties after they're unloading them in, in Southern California. They're putting them right back on ships, sending them back uh, as many as possible to China to get the next shipment of manufactured goods to cash in. Uh, and so this guy, Scott Fippen, who makes some of the best quality almonds on earth uh, in uh, the Central Valley of California, he day after day is learning that despite the fact he has contracts to actually get these containers onto ships, is told, oh, sorry, we don't have a container for you. Oh, actually, that ship that we booked you on, it's not coming. Uh, and so his warehouse is just filling up with orders, some sold, some not sold. He's stuck in California, the customer's in Dubai, and he just can't get them there. I, I, I thought that made uh, a, for a very compelling way to bring home you know, what could otherwise be a very important but boring story. Uh, I mean, I'm always looking for the way to use regular people to, to pull a reader in to a story where they might not think, oh yes, I have an interest in understanding shipping and agricultural commodities, but they're, they are willing to go along for the ride if it's if it's somebody they can relate to who's just trying to run their business. Great. Well, let's talk about Davos Man, a terrific, terrific book. And it, it seems to me that you're looking at sort of three questions. The first one is, you know, just this global elite of billionaires and, and just the power they've amassed. Second, the, the, the related issue of income inequality that is surging in the U.S. and across the world. And the third, the, as you mentioned earlier, the, the political dis disruptions that have kind of ensued from this political uh, inequality. Um, right. And um, so let's just go with Davos, man. And I want to read just a couple sentences from your book and then just have right. you go to town. You, you, this is kind of a playful using the noun, you know, Davos, man, noun. A member of the global billionaire class that controls the majority of the world's wealth, a rare and dangerous predator who attacks without restraint, expanding his territory and seizing the nourishment of others while he deftly assumes the guise of empathy and generosity, lulling his prey into submission. Origin, the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, where the species is known to gather annually to cleanse its reputation. 
So yeah. let's start out by talking about, um, maybe let's just talk about the event. I know you've covered it sure. a number of years, six, seven years. Tell us about covering this event, which is now you know unfolding in, in Davos. Yeah, well, you know, the thing about actually covering the World Economic Forum, which is this gathering of the world's most powerful people, uh, is just how bewildering it is. Uh, I mean, I assume it's bewildering for everyone, but certainly if you're just a lowly journalist, th there's just this perpetual feeling that more interesting things are happening to more powerful people somewhere else. They're like boxes within boxes. So the, the forum front facing is just this gathering of panel discussions on a bunch of predictable topics, you know, earnest discussion of how do we, how are we going to solve climate change? Uh, what's the future of corporate governance? What's the future of work, uh, gender and racial injustice? How can business play a role in solving them? And, but the, the truth is that while that's the public part and the part that most of the journalists are there to cover, uh, most of the people who actually matter in Davos, these are uh, heads of state, the CEOs of giant financial firms, tech firms, consulting firms, they will actually boast that they never set foot inside uh, the Congress Center, the, the, the conference center where this is all hosted. That's like a, a badge of sophistication. Oh, I'm too busy meeting in private suites with the people who actually matter, the public stuff, that's for people who aren't powerful enough to have something better to do. They, they may come in to participate in the simulation of the Syrian refugee experience. I, I'm not making this up. I have seen billionaires submit to being blindfolded and led around in the dark while someone is hollering at them in Arabic, demanding papers, and then they all pat each other on the back and congratulate one another for empathy. And then they go back to you know, their offsite banquet hosted by a global consulting firm or a tech company where they drink champagne uh, and eat truffles. They may come into the conference center to engage in uh, morning mindfulness with the mindfulness guru, John Kabat-Zinn, and then they go back to their private suites to you know, pursue a pharmaceutical merger that will lift drug prices for all of humanity. Uh, th these are the, the realities that are very hard to uh, uh, resolve for the journalist because you're aware that you're in the proximity of the people who actually do make the rules uh, but you can't actually see what they're up to. So the most important people at Davos, they get access not only to their own private suites and various hotels, but they will get access to these lounges run by the forum itself. The forum is, is on paper a nonprofit run by this uh, German economist, Klaus Schwab. In reality, it's a highly lucrative enterprise where he gets the most powerful companies to pay you know, fees up to 100,000 bucks a year for membership. And then at Davos, he very happily plays matchmaker. So in one of these lounges where you know you're not going to encounter some nuisance like a journalist or a regulator, the head of a fossil fuel company can sit opposite a table with a member of the Saudi monarchy and talk about, you know, new stakes to be had. So as, as a journalist, you're acutely aware of the fact that you're supposed to play by access journalism rules and not ask pushy questions. But that's just not how I operate. Uh, and so I've I've gone there and asked pushy questions and it's sometimes been useful, but you really do feel that you're complicit in this charade uh, because ultimately, you know, if you just look at the words spoken at Davos, there's a lot of wise people there. There's very well-intentioned academics, some of the wisest people in their field. There are uh, nonprofits and advocacy organizations that know an awful lot about every conceivable problem you can imagine. And I'm not here to demonize the billionaires. I mean, some of the billionaires, I'm sure, are, are truly concerned about some of these problems. But the net effect of having business go on uh, with the, the, the front facing part, this kind of virtue signaling exercise, is that this institution that meets under the mantra committed to improving the state of the world is really about enabling a status quo among people who are, by any objective measure, the ultimate beneficiaries of the status quo. And they use the participation in Davos to say, look, look at us, you know, earnestly discussing climate change, therefore you don't have to regulate us. Uh, look at us earnestly discussing inequality. So, you know, we don't need to worry about progressive taxation. And where we're not writing books about how business is the future of human progress and we get it, 
we're not just catering to uh, Milton Friedman like uh, shareholders who just want profits. Now we're trying to cater to stakeholders and that's, you know, society and local communities. Therefore, you don't actually have to regulate us. And, and my book ultimately argues that this charade is this kind of prophylactic against those of us in democratic societies using our democratic rights to have a say over who benefits from a very successful form of global capitalism. And in your book, you quote this Mr. Schwab um, as being the, I guess, the architect of this concept of called stakeholder capitalism, right. which says, you know, companies are, are interested in profits, of course, but much more broad interests, including, you know, the climate and income equality and so forth. So there's a, a sense of, as you call it, kind of virtue signaling that right. business is, you know, sure they're into profits, but they also have much wider interests than, than just making profits. Yeah, that's right. So in the run up to the pandemic, uh, Jamie Dimon, who's one of my five key characters, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, he, he's then running the Business Roundtable, which is this lobby shop in Washington that's comprised of, of top CEOs of large companies. And he, he actually gets 180 CEOs to sign off on this statement that says, you know, Milton Friedmanism is over. It's now about stakeholder capitalism. We're ans our companies are now answerable to stakeholders, including labor, never labor unions, but always labor, uh, local communities. Uh, Mark Benioff, who's another one of my key characters, is the CEO of Salesforce. He says at one point, you know, the planet is a stakeholder, which is very reassuring to those of us who live on the planet. Uh, and I, I treat the pandemic as the first test of these lofty principles, and the results are not good. You know, the the Business Roundtable Pledge of Stakeholder Capitalism is signed by Jeff Bezos, another one of my five characters. We now know that Bezos spends the first months of the pandemic denying uh, PPE like face masks and hand sanitizer from his employees who are working in his warehouses. He says, oh, we can't locate any of these things that they are putting into boxes for people who are willing to pay for those things. We know that there's a serious uh, COVID problem. And when uh, the now famous Christian Smalls, who later organizes a labor union uh, at a warehouse in Staten Island says, well, hold on a second, shouldn't we shut down this warehouse until we can get a handle on, on what the level of risk is? He's fired for violating quarantine, which is kind of incredible given that he wants everyone to be quarantined, but with sick pay, something that Amazon has lobbied for years to deny its employees the, the Stakeholder Capitalism Pledge is signed by Albert Borla, who's the CEO of Pfizer, which is this company that we can be grateful for in terms of, in terms of the COVID vaccines. But Borla makes all these pledges about vaccine equity, gives token amounts of vaccines to COVAX, this, this multilateral institution that's supposed to handle vaccine inequality. Well, the result is Pfizer makes out uh, like bandits. They sell tens of billions of dollars worth of COVID vaccines. If you're lucky enough to live in a country wealthy enough to afford whatever Pfizer wants to charge, we get access to plenty of vaccines. Most of humanity doesn't get access. And the result of that is forget the humanitarian catastrophe of the, of the pandemic going on. That's a lot to forget, but let's put it aside for a second. You know, if you simply focus on what does this mean for those of us in wealthy countries, we are subsidizing the monopoly profits of people like Albert Borla through the perpetuation of this pandemic because we've, we've had this open invitation for the variants. And this is why it hits to livelihood, hits to our own lives, the continued fear of the pandemic, uh, all of the curtailing of our freedom that, that's, that's gone along with dealing with the pandemic. All of this flows from how this stakeholder capitalism has amounted to little more than a public relations uh, vehicle while Pfizer gets to sell uh, to the highest bidder. Uh, Larry Fink, who's another one of my prime characters, this is the... Uh, the head of BlackRock, the world's largest asset management company. This is a company that's uh, that manages $10 trillion of wealth around the globe. He's a leading cheerleader for stakeholder capitalism. He's, he's written, written about it. He's branded it. He spends part of the pandemic turning the screws just at the time when he's saying this is a great moment for stakeholder capitalism, turning the screws to the government of Argentina. He had, been, uh, he had put a lot of these pension funds he manages on the hook uh, in Argentina by buying up bonds that seem to have a nice return. Argentina can't pay, poverty soaring, their healthcare costs are going up in the middle of the pandemic. And he personally uh, plays a role in uh, preventing settlements and perpetuating a debt crisis. And, and I argue in the book, it's really 
far beyond Argentina. It's about uh, sending a message to uh, governments indebted around the globe that nobody stiffs Davos man. He understands that lots of governments have borrowed more than they're going to be able to manage. Uh, and he wants to send a message that it's going to be painful if you don't pay back your debts. Well, let's pause for a second on Bezos, because you write about Amazon really uh, insightfully and interestingly. Thank you. And you talk about like the, the, the company's stated principles of, of uh, you know, customer service and, you know, developing the best talent, having the highest standards. But you, then you write the complete list would have to include amassing monopoly power and applying it to crushing a better excuse me, relentlessly squeezing workers for productivity and gang, gaming the tax system to avoid surrendering money to the government. Um, tell us about Bezos and just, I mean, and it, it, you also, uh, it, we're talking about Amazon. You quoted some gentleman saying, you know, if, if, uh, if, if the Marxists wanted to na you know, nationalize the United States, all they could do, they, all they really need to do is come in and grab Amazon and call it a day. Yeah, that was a good line from Franklin Four. Uh, I believe in the New Republic. Yeah, you know, Bezos obviously needs no introduction, but this is a good moment to know that I'm not, I have not written this book to demonize billionaires. Jeff Bezos is by all accounts, a brilliant entrepreneur who had a brilliant idea and has executed it to an extraordinary degree. Uh, and it's not like just anybody could have had this idea around e-commerce uh, and built it out uh, to this extent. Uh, so we can be grateful to Bezos. We can be grateful to Amazon and say, okay, this was a great idea. You executed it. You're going to be really rich. That's part of capitalism. But we can also say, how about paying your taxes? Uh, and how about paying for the infrastructure that has allowed you to amass this tremendous fortune? And how about making sure that the people who are working in your warehouses uh, have some protection in the midst of the worst pandemic in a century? And uh, you know, across the board, Bezos has failed. And, and then, of course, he famously, uh, at, in, in the middle of uh, last summer, uh, blasts himself uh, into space to the tune of five and a half billion dollars, money that could have paid for a lot of vaccines, could have paid for a lot of protective gear, and then actually thanks his employees for uh, playing this critical role in uh, human progress. And this is classic Davos man behavior, right? Like, what do we all get out of Jeff Bezos going into space? Well, we don't get much. And I mean, unless we like the titillation of watching billionaires uh, get blasted into, into, into space, you know, maybe there's some entertainment value to that. What could we have gotten had Amazon uh, been much more serious about protecting its people and leveling with us about uh, the extent of, of, of its troubles uh, in the company? Uh, and what we got, if we look carefully, is how uh, Amazon is ultimately directed. Forget all the stakeholder capitalism mumbo jumbo and the stuff that we're going to hear at Davos this week. It's ruthlessly uh, successful at delivering return to the shareholder and then blaming that ruthlessness on uh, service to the consumer. Um, and if, if you look at the Christian Small story, so here's this African American guy. Uh, who's raised around Newark, New Jersey, who's worked for white managers his entire career, who, and he describes it to me in a long interview that at some point it's like, you know, working in the cotton fields where like white managers are riding around on forklifts with bullhorns telling mostly black employees to move faster. And suddenly it's, it's early 2020 and Christian Smalls notices that most of the white managers are suddenly gone. He's told, oh, they're at an offsite meeting. Oh, they're all on vacation. Oh, that's interesting. We're all here laboring with no protective gear. I can see on these big flat screen TVs in the break room that there's a, a pandemic that really concerns me. And when he starts asking questions and eventually organizes a walkout, he's not only fired, but then the general counsel of Amazon, a guy named Zapolsky, actually says, according to um, uh, minutes of a meeting that Vice News uh, obtained, uh, at a meeting with Bezos present, says, well, we should train the lens on Christian Smalls, because to the extent to which we can make him the face of this movement, he's not smart or articulate. We'll, uh, we'll really benefit from that. Uh, and this becomes just a public relations fiasco for Amazon. Uh, Zapolsky, it turns out, on his Facebook profile, you learn that uh, he attended elite uh, well, he attended Ivy League universities. He grew up going to elite schools in northern New Jersey, not that far from where Christian Smalls grew up. 
and he has a uh, salute to the uh, the the late uh, civil rights hero John Lewis. When I asked Amazon, how do we square that with this, you know, not smart or articulate trope put on this prominent African American labor activist? Oh, Mr. Zapolsky was not aware of Mr. Smalls' race at the time he made those comments. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, Bezos is um, is a guy who's who's going to cater to the bottom line. Well, let's talk about a community that's been affected by this huge economic disruption, and it's one that's close to us so geographically, Granite City. Because um, right. you do this wonderful profile of Granite City, which was a steel town, uh, sort of from like maybe the 1870s and 1970s. Right. Steel was the core. You know, the steel industry goes down and um, the town struggles really badly. And you write, um, um, it was not globalization that was to blame for the despair in Granite City. It was the way the gains had been apportioned not by accident, but willfully and meticulously as a dream, as a means of directing more treasure to Davos men like Bezos. Talk about Granite City. Yeah, you bet. So Granite City is this incredibly important steel town uh, where when I first visited in the summer of 2016, there are all of these uh, steel workers. Uh, these are you know proud union steel workers who for their entire lives have been told, well, we're union people, we vote Democratic, and they are uh, finding the message of Trump very attractive. They, they especially like that Trump is promising a trade war against China uh, because they've absorbed this idea that China is to blame for all of their problems. And there's, you know, there's some complexity here. There's no question that China... Uh, has dumped a lot of steel at below market rates onto, onto world markets, and that's depressed uh, the price of steel. There's no question that China uh, is taking liberties with the global trading rules. And, you know, there's a lot of state subsidies. There's a lot of, uh, th there's a lack of enforcement of environmental rules. China's not playing fair. But if you look at who's benefiting from uh, the, the terms of engagement by U.S. Steel, at this point, U.S. Steel is now in charge of this old steel works uh, started by uh, a couple of German immigrants back at the end of the 19th century. You know, the, the, the executives are making out just fine, even when the company is not doing well at all. The executives are collecting multi-million dollar bonuses while the workers I'm talking to in Granite City are furloughed and wondering how they're going to send their kids to college, wondering how they're going to pay for health care while the town uh, is just uh, deteriorating. You know, suddenly it's just uh, dollar stores and tattoo parlors and, and payday lenders that are taking up residence in, 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 in the downtown with grocery stores and boutiques and uh, the bowling alleys shut down. Uh, and so, so life is really very challenging. Where I get into these stories, and I focus on one guy named Mike Morrison, who's a guy who you know had worked really hard, had risen uh, through a thirty-year career uh, to become uh, one of the crane drivers, which is one of the most important and best-paid jobs. If, if you don't do that job well, you could kill somebody. You could you could cause an accident that could cost millions of dollars. Uh, and he's eventually laid off. He has to tell his uh, middle child, <coughs> excuse me, that that they're going to have to uh, find. They're going to have to go to community college. They're not going to be able to continue with the private school that he's able to finance, in the hopes that they'll do something in the white collar world. And Michael Morrison is finding the Trump message. Uh, he's never voted uh, for a Republican in his life. Very uh, attractive, and eventually. Michael Morrison loses his job, goes to work in an Amazon warehouse for a day where he just doesn't stick because he's just appalled as a union guy that the, the local Amazon warehouse people are giving him a hard time for not cheering, you know, go Amazon. And he says, hey, I don't I don't roll that way. Uh, and they say, well, you know, that's that's how we do it here. And then, of course, it's not a union shop. He ends up working at another warehouse, you know, working for a, a, just a fraction of his previous earnings. And the point I'm trying to make with this history is that Trump is tapping into a sentiment that is real and that is legitimate in that large numbers of people in America who previously 
uh, were able to uh, earn a decent middle class living uh, as long as they got up early and and went off to work and stayed out of trouble. They can't count on that anymore. But the problem, but but the, the problems that the Michael Morrisons of the world are facing, they're not made in China. These are problems that are made in the boardrooms in, in New York, in Seattle, in Congress. The U.S. is a net beneficiary of global trade, and U.S. steel has done just fine as a publicly traded entity. It's just that it's rewarded a handful of shareholders and hasn't looked after people like Michael Morrison. And that's left a lot of people really angry. Uh, and it's especially, I mean, I deal with the issue of race in the book, uh, especially white working class people who are prone uh, to being uh, touched by a, a kind of innate white supremacy. This idea that, you know, going on, going to the unemployment office and asking for help with your mortgage, that's something for other than white people to deal with in society. And Trump taps into that too. It's not like one or the other. That We've had this kind of false debate where either we write off all the Trump voters as just a bunch of racists and white supremacists, or no, we're supposed to humanize them and understand you know, their economic troubles. It's all of the above working uh, together. And Trump very effectively uh, speaks to these people and gives them very simplistic uh, solutions. You know, oh, it's immigrants coming over the, the wall and I'm going to build a wall and that's going to take care of your economic problems. I'm going to hit China with tariffs, which does for a while help some steel workers, but actually damages the American economy because there's six times as many people who get up and go to work at factories that buy steel as there are people who make steel. So he's just jacked up the cost of their key endpoint by, by 25% and has made American companies less competitive. This story, this Granite City story, I tell again and again in a global context in other countries where real economic problems, large numbers of people who conclude quite legitimately that their ability to support their families at a middle class standard, that just doesn't amount to very much for the people running the economy. And they ultimately embrace solutions peddled by political opportunists who often make their problems worse. And, and in the case of Trump, of course, he goes out and hands out giant tax cuts to the people who are convening in Davos right now, damages American productivity, but he's a TV star, gets a photo op with people like Michael Morrison when the steel fa factory comes back online, and that becomes its own truth, never mind the fact that he's actually catering to the plutocrats who gave us this economy. Well, in the, the concept of income inequality, I was reading a study by the Council on Foreign Relations, and, and they, they begin it by saying public, public policy experts call income and wealth inequality one of the defining challenges of this century. Income and wealth inequality in the United States is substantially higher than in almost any other developed nation, and it's on the rise, sparking an intensifying national debate. Also saw a UN study which said that, you know, income inequality is, is eroding trust in democracy around the world. Right. And you, throw, you, you use uh, some just really powerful numbers. You, you note that in the last 40 years, the wealthiest 1% of Americans gained $21 trillion, where households in the bottom half saw their incomes or their wealth fall by $900 billion. And I'll just throw out one other number and have you talk more broadly. You say, sure. since 1978, corporate executives have seen total compensation rise by more than 900%, where wages for the typical American have risen 12%. Right. Talk about the challenge of income inequality. I mean, I think that the challenge of income inequality, uh, which is a reflection of things I get into in the book, I mean, the, the billionaire class taking an economy that post-World War II till about the 1970s, uh, till the middle of the 1970s in the US, actually did the whole cliche, rising tide lifts all boats. You know, we had economic growth, we had innovation, uh, we had every part of the economy benefiting, and they warped it and rewrote the rules uh, and, you know, expanded loopholes in the tax code, wrote new ones, lifted antitrust enforcement, uh, essentially annihilated organized labor and made it hard for, for workers to organize to get a, their own share of the bounty. And so none of this happens by accident. The, role, the result of this is what economic growth we get flows into the hands of a very narrow group of people. I mean, highly educated people do well. If you're working in a white collar job at a multinational that's doing well in international trade, you're doing well. But the billionaires end up with most of the good stuff. And and the consequences of this go beyond 
uh, owe people in Granite City who used to be able to own their homes and take care of them, go on vacations. Now they can't anymore. It, it goes to the heart of like, what sort of credibility does our system have? And, and this, again, I've looked at globally like this. I, I've confronted this question in the context of lesser but still similar uh, forms of inequality from Italy to France to Britain to Sweden. This this fundamental question of like who benefits and if huge numbers of people feel that they have been effectively kicked out of the economy and their needs and interests just don't matter. Well, they'll not only embrace sometimes insane conspiracy theories, which helps explain, you know, why we have such low rates of vaccination in the states, why we have the January 6th insurrection, why we have Brexit, the most elaborate act of economic self-harm that I've ever witnessed, you know, all about taking back control and uh, in, in, while, you know, damaging a trading relationship with Britain's largest trading partner. This sort of stuff happens time and again. And I think if we look forward, it's very difficult to imagine. I mean, we've now lived through this pandemic where all sorts of distrust uh, has turned into low rates of vaccination, uh, demonization of people over decisions to wear face masks or not. All of this speaks to the deep polarization that we have, which is fueled by inequality. But going forward, like, how are we going to deal with climate change? If the ordinary person in many major developed economies like the states can look around and see that, hey, in Davos, they're talking about win-win solutions, which is an elaborate way of saying no one has to sacrifice. How do we say to a coal miner in West Virginia, sorry, uh, you're going to have to find something else to do because the, the uh, uh, perseverance of our species depends upon that. That person can quite legitimately look at the last half century of life and say, well, hold on a second. If I give up my way of life, who's helping my family with health care? Who's going to help me pay my mortgage? Who's going to make sure that my kid can, can finish college? If I give this up, I know that the billionaire class, they're not giving anything up. They're talking about win-win solutions. So this kind of inequality becomes a powerful threat to democratic society. If we don't share the burdens of our problems, we can't solve our problems. Well, Peter, you, you, you did this great uh, writing on the pandemic and, and how that's worse and things. And, and the one you, you did a really terrific job talking about the CARES Act, a $2.2 mm -hmm. trillion dollar package that was passed in uh, April, I think, of 2020. Right. And I think the broad narrative was, OK, finally, you know, Congress is working together. We have a bipartisan solution a robust federal response, you know, our system is working. But as you uh, kind of decipher the CARES Act, you found 178, about $170 billion tax cut uh, provisions for real estate developers, 500 billion for large companies. Um, the Paycheck Protection Program is written in such a way that large hospital chains and restaurants can tap into it. Then there's a separate initiative, about $4 trillion that the Fed is is releasing effectively right. that um, that the, the Davos folks have kind of a peculiar uh, access to. So, talk about just how the pandemic has has really even made this inequality debate more uh, explosive. Right. Well, you know, we did some good things in the CARES Act. These expanded unemployment benefits turned out were pretty critical in keeping the lights on in a lot of households. Uh, and that was better than what we got after the 2008 financial crisis and the Great Recession. Uh, but the cost of some uh, very meaningful fiscal stimulus for ordinary people came with this invitation for every corporate interest to gather around the trough. Uh, and, and the result of that is, you know, we bailed out asset holders time and again. So, you know, I write about uh, the private equity industry. Uh, I focus on Steve Schwartzman, who's the world's most successful private equity uh, magnate. And, you know, he's on the hook. He's got a bond portfolio that's on the hook to a bunch of fossil fuel companies that haven't actually made any money in years and years. They've been very good at basically borrowing at very low rates and then going through the machinations of tapping into uh, reserves that they often don't even explore. Uh, and then finding somebody to buy their bonds at a higher rate and just getting out. Uh, and suddenly in the middle of the pandemic, that whole business model doesn't work anymore because money is, is seizing up. And thanks to the Fed, uh, combined with uh, Steve Mnuchin's uh, treasury, there are now just across the board bailouts 
for a whole series of, of bondholders who would have uh, taken huge losses uh, because uh, there is this belief that we have to rescue asset holders in the American economy or very bad things happen. And some asset holders probably do need to be rescued. I mean, we probably would have would have come out ahead uh, post-2008 financial crisis if we'd helped out homeowners instead of uh, uh, sticking to this dogma that it would just be so incredibly unfair if we you know, bailed out homeowners, we'd probably have less cynicism and, and, and the recession that we got probably would have been uh, a, a lot uh, less painful for large numbers of people. But time and again, what we see is that large companies that have access to Fed rescue funds, you know, they do incredibly well while the hits to livelihood for ordinary people uh, go are, are deep and painful. Uh, we have free enterprise for people who can't hire lobbyists. Uh, and we have a kind of corporate welfare for companies and, and institutions that are big enough to, to get rescues. And that's that's basically how the CARES Act played out. Well, in terms of how we fix this situation, I mean, you make a really strong case that the tax code is critical to make it fair, sure. taxing uh, both both income and also especially wealth. Um, you know, obviously, anything that could do to be to strengthen wages and the power of labor, public investments, you, you say the big truth is that growth actually comes from, you know, robust investments in education, infrastructure, public health, etc. What um, what is the best case scenario? I mean, how do we start stabilizing and then improving this this uh, this important question of income inequality? Well, the the solutions are fairly straightforward and easy to say. The problem is they involve taking on the entrenched political power of the Davos men who have seized control of our system. Uh, what we need to do, we don't need some sort of revolution. We don't need flights of fancy. This isn't you know utopian vision time. We need what we actually already had before. I mean, from again, from 1945, Till the middle of the 70s, the U.S. had much higher rates of taxation, had serious antitrust enforcement to protect against monopoly power, and much higher rates of union representation. And the result of that was we had a lot of growth. We had a lot of innovation. We had a lot of successful capitalism. And we need to get back to that. It's, it's, I don't have some sort of fetish for the 60s. I don't, I don't want a time machine backwards. We made a lot of social progress that we want to hang on to. We don't want to go back to Jim Crow and the Vietnam War. But we do want to go back to working people employed at companies that are more productive, sharing the gains through wages, not through stakeholder capitalism and photo ops and, you know, signing bonuses in times of, of labor shortages like the one we're in now. We want wages that families can depend on so they can go out and consume, so they can buy houses and buy cars and fix up their property and, and, uh, you know, pay for stuff that we enjoy. And and that that's going to require getting back to the nitty gritty of, uh, of, of running an economy, not just for a handful of shareholders who, you know, employ lobbyists uh, and own residences the way most of us own socks. Uh, that's going to come down to uh, a, a shift of political power that's only going to happen through mobilization. I mean, the solution to our problems our democracy has been taken from us by a handful of corporate interests. We need to take them back uh, and exercise basic democratic rights. Global capitalism is, has been tremendously uh, beneficial. We're just not distributing the gains properly. And we need to get over this idea that we can count on the the, the goodness of, of Davos man, you know, going back to the top of the mountain in Switzerland, proclaiming their adherence to stakeholder capitalism, we got to get back to doing the work of democracy ourselves and having a say about who, who benefits. Well, in your book, you argue that, that candidate Biden made this income inequality a main theme. <coughs> and then you, you were writing this probably more than a year ago, but you say, if he fails to f follow through, the consequences could be potentially profound. The Biden years could raise expectations for fair redress before giving way to familiar disappointment as wage stagnate while billionaires add to their winnings. That could wind up fertilizing the ground for an updated, more sophisticated version of Trump. Trump is gone, but Trumpism may yet have a bright future. Right. As you look at the Biden years so far, I mean, we have the midterms looming. Um, 
how do you think uh, how do you think he's done on this issue? I mean, unfortunately, I think my uh, forward looking statements of more than a year ago have have held up. Uh, I, I mean, we don't have to get into a detailed political debate about why, but virtually nothing meaningful has changed, right? The the nature of our conversation has changed. We don't have wealth taxes. Uh, none of the tax proposals uh, that Biden trotted out have amounted to anything. The tax code remains just, just as it was uh, during the Trump years. We do have, because of supply chain troubles uh, that we've already discussed, we do have a moment where uh, labor is now commanding much higher wages and where there's a whole conversation about inflation around that and no one seems to talk about uh, executive compensation and you know record corporate profits uh, that go go in, into that. Uh, but the basic structure of our economy is is the same. I mean, the next time there's a downturn, workers can can lose these signing bonuses and higher wages because this isn't happening in the context of collective bargaining. And I I, I do think uh, that we're in a dynamic where uh, we're dealing with, you know, tremendous inflation that's in part uh, fueled by supply chain problems, in part uh, because of a lot of stimulus uh, that's sloshing through the economy. The Fed is tightening. Some people are going are gonna to suffer uh, as uh, potentially we land in recession, or at least we have lower growth. And uh, the we're definitely going to have an argument that the Biden years, which haven't even delivered much, are the problem that's given us these troubles that in fact stem from the same policies that have been in place for half a century. Uh, and I, I, I'd be surprised if the Republicans don't succeed in uh, capitalizing on that opportunity to double down on what Davos man is very good at getting, which is more tax cuts and deregulation. Well, let's tell us about tell us about your next book. You made a kind of an allusion to uh, supply chain, chain and shipping. Is that something that's uh, a new book that's under the uh, under the works? Yeah, I'm deep into the next book, which is going to be called, uh, I think, How the World Ran Out of Everything. And it's a look at uh, the supply chain problems, uh, again, fo following that container from China to Mississippi but looking in depth at what's happened to railroads, what's happened to shipping, what's happened to trucking, uh, what's happened to warehouse work, and discovering that time and again, our supply chain problems that, that might seem to be connected directly to the pandemic really reflect decades of the downgrading of work. You know, it's not that we've run out of truck drivers. There's 10 million uh, commercial driver's license holders in America. We only need about a third of that many. We've run out of people who are willing to uh, take on this uh, very difficult, poorly paid work. Uh, and that's true in, in, in rail. That's true in, in warehouses. And then there's a lot of monopoly power that's been allowed to rise uh, because of uh, some of the things I get into in this last book, Davos, man. I mean, if, if, you, if you organize your economy around shareholder gains and uh, you downgrade wages as a cost to be maintained, uh, the result of that is you're going to run out of people willing to do things that we need them to do. Well, Peter, finally, in your uh, your acknowledgments, you you know you thank many of your colleagues, your family, but also intriguingly, you thank a park, <laughs> Hampstead <laughs> Heath. I think you may be the first one in the history of uh, literature to thank a park. Tell us about how that park helped you get through COVID, and also sure. kind of helped you uh, clear your head to write this book. Yeah, you're the first person who's noticed that. Uh, so we were living in this wonderful neighborhood in North London called Hampstead, which is next to the Hampstead Heath, this magnificent park uh, with lots of wilderness and beautiful trails. And uh, our baby boy was born on uh, April 8th, 2020, just as I'm thinking about this book, Davos Man, uh, in the middle of the pandemic. And uh, the world shut down. My older kids are dealing with distance learning. Uh, my wife is contending with that and taking care of a newborn. Uh, and I, I got the, the the best deal in the family. My job was to uh, put my baby boy into a baby carrier and walk around with him for miles and miles uh, all day in the beautiful Hampstead Heath. Uh, and then I'd come back and, you know, cook and shop and wh whatever and, and take care of kids. But in a very tough time with our family, like many families around the world, you know, I mean, I, we had it a lot better than most. I'm not I'm not asking for violence to play for us. But in, you know, in the darkness of the pandemic and our lives disrupted, that park, which I always loved, uh, just became like my vital link to everything that mattered. So I, I am grateful to the Hampstead Heath. 
Wow, that sounds good. Well, Peter, this has been a terrific conversation. And when your new book comes out, I'm going to coax you to Carbondale to talk Love about it. it and also to meet with students. I think you would, you're the, exactly the sort of person you need to make economics come alive and relevant. Just your ability to explain and write about it is really terrific. Oh, well, thank you so much, John. I really enjoyed your questions. This was, this was a, a great deal of fun. Thanks for digging in. Great. Well, thanks very much. And thanks to all of you for watching this. We will have it on our, uh, our YouTube channel tomorrow. Show it to family and friends. And thank you for supporting the Institute and keeping the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.